Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Jack Wolfson. Jack Wolfson is a board certified cardiologist and a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. He has been featured by the likes of NBC and CNN and covered in publications like USA Today and the Wall Street Journal. Before starting Wolfson Integrative Cardiology, Jack was the Chairman of the Department of Medicine and Director of Cardiac Rehabilitation at Paradise Valley Hospital, Arizona. He was also a partner in Arizona's largest cardiology practice. Jack has taught thousands of physicians his ideas and techniques for holistic cardiovascular health. His book, The Paleocardiologist, The Natural Way to Heart Health, has been an Amazon number one bestseller. He is a highly sought after lecturer and is a powerful voice in the fight against the nefarious motivations of the pharmaceutical industry. I had a great conversation with Jack, he's a really switched on guy and I really like his simple and broad reaching approach to health. He's been able to take the best ideas from many of the great researchers and authors of past and present and put them together in a complete approach, not only for cardiovascular health but for all aspects of health and longevity. With all this being said, I hope you enjoy the episode. How you doing, Jack? I'm doing fantastic, Cameron. Get, uh, great to connect. Yeah, yeah, it's really good to speak with you. I've um, I've been listening to your content for a few years now, and um, I really like the way that you think and um, the way that you're connecting a lot of dots. Um, you practice cardiology uh, a little bit differently than than most, I imagine. So, um, what sort of led you down that path to think a little bit more broadly and to try and connect more of these dots together? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm a conventionally trained cardiologist like my father before me. I did 10 years of training after, after my undergraduate and three years into practice as a busy hospital based cardiologist, I met the woman who would eventually uh, become my wife and she opened up my eyes to all things, health and wellness. Uh, at the time I saw sickness all around me. I saw sickness in my own family, including my father who was dying of a rare Parkinson's like illness. And the Mayo Clinic, obviously one of the most pristine uh, and uh, you know prestigious and esteemed hospital systems in the world, had no treatment for my father, and they also had no reason why my father was sick. And then I meet this 29-year-old chiropractor, and she's got all the reasons why my father is sick. She said, you know, the way your father eats, the way your father lives, the way your father thinks, uh, everything about you know your father's lifestyle is geared towards him being sick. And again, it made perfect sense. And ultimately, I would start to change. She said, you need to become a DC. I said, DC, I, like I should go back to, car- you know, I should go to chiropractic school for years. And uh, yeah, I said, I just finished up all this medical training. And she said, no, not a DC doctor of chiropractic, but a DC doctor of cause. And that's what uh, eventually led me to leave the biggest group in the state of, uh, of Arizona. There was over 50 practitioners in that group. Uh, of, of cardiologists and surgeons. I would leave that group, start my own practice, natural heart doctor. And here we are 10 years later and I get to talk with uh, uh, brilliant minds like yourself. So thank you. No, thank you, Jack. Um, I'm, I wanna get straight into it. Um, hardly anyone talks about how the heart is an electromagnetic organ. Um, almost everyone knows that you can uh, pick up the movements and of the heart, you know, with, um, with electromagnetic, um, you know, sensors. So what do you see as the impact of our increasing use of things like phone phones? We've got cell towers popping up all over the place, computers, you know, wires all throughout the house. What's the impact of these non-native EMFs on cardiovascular health? Uh, I think uh, ultimately it's going to be proven to be pretty catastrophic. And, uh, you know, some people have overt symptoms when they're around these, you know, this wireless radio, uh, you know, communication radiation, and, and they have palpitations, skip beats, some have atrial fibrillation. Ultimately, the, the brain and autonomic nervous system control uh, coronary blood flow, leading, you know, the sympathetic parasympathetic systems and leading to coronary blood flow, total vascular blood flow, circulation, uh, you know, over the entire body, uh, including uh, uh, clotting, if you will. And, uh, um, the, 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 these man-made EMFs, these non-native EMFs, as you said, 
you know, people like Martin Paul have documented this, but unfortunately, there's just not enough scientific research going into this. Uh, there's plenty of research that tries to come up with propaganda statements to tell us that it's all safe. Uh, but the reality is, at a minimum, we know uh, a lot. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, more and more is coming on. But I think, you know, as you pointed out, listen, we, we check an EKG, we're looking at the electrical rhythm. We check an EEG, looking at the brain's rhythm. Uh, we check an EMG, we're looking at the neuromuscular interface. We are all electric, all electricity, and the man-made EMFs have to negatively impact that, uh, that process. So when you're working with patients, is your advice mostly just to, you know, disconnect, turn, turn the devices off, switch them off, uh, get, get as far away from them as possible. Um, you know, it's almost impossible to get away from them completely, but um, do you see results when people, you know, switch them off and get, you know, cut out all the power to their house at night and turn the Wi-Fi off and, and that kind of thing? Well, I think that, uh, you know, obviously we tell people a lot of different things as it pertains to what I would say is the whole eat well, live well, think well process. So when we get people to eat the right foods, live the right lifestyle, think the correct thoughts, think their best thoughts, that leads to the best results. Now, inside of that live well is, you know, removing the environmental toxins and pollutants. And of course, man-made electromagnetic radiation would be one of those environmental toxins. So listen, as you said, we're never going to be able to totally avoid it. One of the main things I love to talk about is the movie Castaway with the actor Tom Hanks. And he winds up on a remote island. He's eating coconuts, fish, and avocados. And He's getting, you know, sunshine and he's and he's going to sleep on time and there's not, you know, much, uh, if any, you know, pollution that's there. And you can say, well, of course, he doesn't have Wi-Fi there. There's no smart meter there. He doesn't have a cell phone there. But there are satellites, you know, over every, you know, square you know, inch of this entire planet and, uh, you know, radio communications that are going on, you know, worldwide. So all of us are impacted. I think all we can do is the best you can. Yeah. Turn off the Wi-Fi at night. If you can turn off the circuit breaker to your bedroom, that's another positive step. If you can move the bed away from the electrical switch uh, and electrical socket where most people write their, their reading light or whatever, you know, their lamp is plugged into the wall right next to their brain, unhook that, you know, get a, get a, um, a trimeter, you know, and see the, the EMF that they're being exposed to in their home, getting rid of the smart meter, some simple thing, you know, turning off the cell phone at night or at the very least putting it on, on alarm mode or even the very least uh, would be for someone who's like, listen, you know, I've got a, I've got a teenage uh, uh, son or daughter or uh, someone I need to keep in uh, close contact with. Well, then just turn off the mobile data on your phone. So it's not constantly being up, you know, email updates and everything else that's coming into your phone. It's just the phone uh, function. But those are some strategies that we use. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really like those strategies. And I think over a long period of time, you know, we're talking about a lifetime of exposure. If you if you can minimize it just a little bit every single day, then the, over the course of a lifetime, it can make a huge difference. Um, well, you know, it's it's not up to us to prove that they're unsafe. It's up to them to prove that the technology is safe. And of course, they've never done that. So, uh, you know, in the meantime, it's kind of like, you know, listen, uh, better safe than sorry. These are real easy steps. We're not, you know, listen, you're talking on a computer. I'm on a computer. I use a cell phone. Everybody does. It's just the way the world is. Uh, hopefully it's not quite as dangerous as we think that it, it likely is. But that being said, and I think also, listen, if you do all of those mitigation strategies, if you're eating well, if you're living well and, and thinking well, then hopefully it allows you to survive. Then if you're someone who eats you know, fast food, doesn't get sunshine, doesn't get sleep, does the, all the other things incorrectly, then on top of that, the EMF is a serious problem. Yeah, I, I think um, I think I wish we could apply the precautionary principle there. I feel the same way about organic food. You know, why, why, why should they have to label their food? The other food should have to be labeled, you know, chemical food. Um, you're quite vocal about um, organics and um, particularly something that I found interesting with you is you talk a lot about seafood. Um, I know, you know, of uh, Jack Cruz's work, which I've found quite interesting as well. Can you... Um, 
let me in a little bit on why you think seafood is such an important part, um, which I think so many people miss. I hardly ever hear anyone talk about seafood. Yeah, and I think also, you know, especially in the carnivore space, you hear a lot of people talking about carnivore diet, carnivore nutrition. And, uh, you know, I and I've told this to Saladino, uh, you know, to his face, uh, Sean Baker, not so much. Sean Baker is about 6'4 and about 250. I'd be real careful what I said to that guy in his face. But Saladino, I'll say it to his face. You know, they miss out on the seafood story. They talk about eating nose to tail animal. But again, you got to eat kind of that nose to tail seafood as well. And seafood is the healthiest food on the planet. There is no second or third place. Uh, the people, it, it, all, all literature says that the pescatarians, people who eat seafood, live the longest, live the best. Those omega threes are uh, just uh, the, the major component of all cell membranes. The brains of the cell is the cell membrane. It's not the it's not the nucleus. It's not the DNA. That's just the architectural work. That's just the, the the replication code and the code for proteins. But again, all you know, you know, turning on and off all those genes, all predicated on on that cell membrane, which ultimately is loaded with cholesterol and omega three fats from seafood. So love eating lots of seafood. Uh, Jack Cruz, you know, brilliant man. Uh, Jack and I first met in 2017. We both spoke at an event in uh, in Vermont. I've got a lot of respect for his work. Uh, but I think ultimately Jack and some other people who have studied the work of Jack miss uh, miss the food story. I think, you know, ultimately yeah, he pushes the seafood, but he kind of uh, does not give enough uh, recognition to the dangers of the pesticide produce, of the chemical foods, as we said. And uh, it's it's ultimately, it, it is a massive factor. It's not all about the sunshine, uh, although sunshine obviously is critically important. Uh, we do know that people who have the highest amount of pesticide exposure, they have three, 400 percent higher risk of cardiovascular mortality. That is in the literature. And I guess essentially it's quite simple. Whatever kills pests uh, kills humans. Yeah, that's uh, it's a really good point. And, and uh, Stephanie Seneff has been a guest on the show as well. So uh, I think her work is fantastic. And um, there's plenty of good books out there that, you know, build the strongest case against them as possible. Um, and I think the more people that buy organic food, the cheaper it's going to get and the more the farmers are going to go, well, let's ditch the pesticides and, and, and grow food the right way. And uh, I think, uh, I think there's a movement happening because of discussions like this. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, yeah, we measure, we measure everyone's glyphosate level. We measure the levels in everyone's urine and everybody has some level of glyphosate. Of course, glyphosate is a man-made uh, chemical and our level should be 0, 0.00. Everyone has glyphosate in their system. Even uh, uh, organic eaters uh, sometimes have higher levels uh, than average. Now, again, the laboratory reports kind of like in control, moderate, and then high level, but I would postulate the in control level, the, right? The normal level is 0.00, .00 as it is for plastic and any of these other uh, uh, dangerous environmental toxins. But Stephanie Zenith's book, Toxic Legacy, is a fantastic read, fantastic proof for anyone who's got, um, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, concerns and anyone who wants to teach other people, you know, the truth about glyphosate, what's happening, obviously, if it interferes with the with the uh, amino acid glycine, glycine is a vital component to build glutathione. And you just go on and on with that. Unfortunately, there's just not enough literature on glyphosate. Uh, Stephanie Seneff is really pushing the envelope on that. And I wish some other people would kind of take up the lead on that, Stephanie, with all due respect and, and, and no denigration to her at all. But again, she's she's getting on in her years and still does amazing work. I mean, her book is from last year. But that being said, we need a lot more younger researchers taking lead on this and, and really proving uh, uh, you know, how dangerous glyphosate, you know, and the other environmental toxins are back from DDT, uh, before that lead arsenate before that, uh, arsenic that actually is documented pretty well in a book, uh, called the moth and the iron lung, uh, by, uh, Forrest Moretti. And that's a fantastic book about, uh, the real story of polio, which my wife and I've been talking about since 2005, but Moretti really documents it well, tells an easy story, you know, in his book in 2018, everybody should read that book. Yeah, awesome stuff. I, I'm aware of I'm aware of that book. I haven't read it yet, but it's on the list. Um, another guest um, that I've had on the show is Gerald Pollack, and um, it seems like if you're talking about the cardiovascular system, 
uh, you have to be talking about water as well. Um, what do you think the impact of healthy water in the body um, is on heart health and cardiovascular health in general? Well, you know, and I, and I did work, learn about the work of Gerald Pollack from, uh, from Jack Cruz, because Jack talks about his stuff a lot. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, obviously it's very, very fascinating because you, as you extrapolate the, 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 the flow through a, a tube, uh, an Atheon tube, as, as Pollock, you know, did a lot of his research and you look at that flow through a capillary, for example, you know, the tiny, uh, uh blood vessels that carry that oxygen, uh, oxygenated blood on one end. And then on the other end is the unox is the less oxygenated blood, uh, 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 as the body uses up oxygen and of course other nutrients and then the cellular waste uh, goes out through the other, or other end of the capillary and then to the big veins and then ultimately to the heart and the lungs and, and to the liver for detoxification and excretion uh, and the kidneys for that matter, the whole process. So again, the work of Gerald Pollack, I think is very, very interesting. I think ultimately it also uh, leads into the, some of the stuff that Stephanie Seneff talks about, about, uh, you know, membranes, the endothelium, the importance of uh, sulfur and sulfates on the inside of blood vessels and blood vessel flow. And I think really that cardiologists in general just have no idea of that uh, pathophysiology and the anatomy of that region and the importance of understanding it as it pertains to, you know, to, you know, circulation and whatnot. But, you know, again, um, you know, understanding that the uh, you know, majority of the body in the water is made in the mitochondria and the health of the mitochondria, of course, as an energy producer of ATP, but also as a producer of water. And, uh, you know, again, just kind of, you know, looking, looking at health and wellness through that, you know, lens of the endothelium and endothelial health, I think is absolutely critical. So really thankful for the work of, of Gerald Pollack to get a lot of that understanding and uh, it's been uh, it's been uh, you know exciting stuff. You know his book, the fourth phase of water. You know ultimately, it really really just kind of helps us understand the importance. Uh, you know ultimately of the mitochondria and producing that cellular water. Really cool stuff. Mm. What so what kind of water um, do you drink personally? Are you a fan of reverse osmosis and remineralizing it or? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the majority of the water that we drink. I mean, I'd love to believe that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, Jack Cruz talks a lot about Pellegrino water. I don't know if he still does or not, but Jack was talking about Pellegrino as the number one water source of sulfur. And again, how sulfur makes glutathione and sulfur leads to sulfation, which makes blood flow better, you know, for example, and cellular communication better, cell to cell, uh, cell membrane, all those kind of things. So, uh, I mean, the issue with whether it's a Pellegrino or any bottled water from an aquifer uh, is, is the water that's feeding that particular source. And how do we know the quality of that, knowing that the whole planet ultimately is, is polluted with pesticides and chemicals and metals and, and whatnot. So uh, the safest water may be, like you said, reverse osmosis water. So it's, it's done through a multi-step process to make sure that the water is clean and then to uh, and then to remineralize and also restructure the water as well. So a company we use comes out of California, where ultimately they run the water over river rock and lodestone to add back structure and charge to the water. Uh, I think that's uh, the best water of what we consume, what we cook with, um, and then understanding obviously that chlorine in the water, fluoride in the water, chemicals in the water. Uh, yeah, and and ultimately if you're drinking off a well. Uh, then you want to get your your water tested to make sure that it's as clean as you think it is. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I'm not sure there's too many people um, in Australia that have uh, well water, but yeah, the water, the municipal water here is pretty terrible. So um, yeah, reverse osmosis is kind of a must here. Um, I guess the water story sort of takes us to the mitochondria. Um, there's probably enough evidence now to... Um, definitely say that cardiovascular disease is a metabolic disorder. It's a problem with, you know, metabolic function. Um, I got quite interested in the work of Dr. Stephen Sinatra. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of his work, but um, he sort of talks about supporting the mitochondria with um, a few key nutrients. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on, um, you know, CoQ10, magnesium, D-ribose, uh, those, those types of nutrients. 
Yeah, you know, ultimately, you know, Stephen Sinatra is the founder of, uh, or the founding father of holistic and integrative cardiology, and and doctors like Joel Kahn, who I know you've interviewed, uh, and others, you know, follow in the footsteps of Sinatra. So, again, uh, having someone like that, uh, you know, you know, really kind of lay the groundwork in the late 1990s, early 2000s is fantastic. Uh, Sinatra, though, I think, you know, ultimately, he's... Um, you know, it, it's nice that he has some of those key nutrients, but there's so many other things that uh, that you know that we focus on more so than adding supplemental L-carnitine or D-ribose. The literature on the use of D-ribose, again, is very, very small. Uh, obviously, magnesium is is commonplace and used uh, ubiquitously these days. But, uh, you know, so, so D-ribose, L-carnitine, I, I really don't reach for those. In my extreme heart failure patients, uh, I'll reach for D-ribose. I don't have a problem with D-ribose. I'm not aware of any negative to it. Uh, it is a, it is an expensive supplement. So again, it tends to be lower down on my list. And then uh, supplemental CoQ10. Uh, I think uh, you know most people you know agree that supplemental CoQ10 has benefit. Again, we measure everyone's CoQ10 levels, but the most uh, you know play, the the best place where I would get CoQ10 is eating animal heart. Uh, the animal heart is loaded with, with CoQ10. Uh, so which really takes us back to the food story. It's about eating organ meats as, you know, that is kind of like if seafood is number one and organs are kind of like 1A and the best thing would be the, the organ from, uh, from a fish, right? And, and maybe that's why, you know, again, cod liver oil uh, has been used for, for so many years as far as a nutritional supplement and ultimately it'd be the cod liver or would actually be salmon liver, which would be that ultimate source uh, of nutrients. And, uh, you know, ultimately if we, you know, if we could do it with food and we can get people to eat the organs, uh, you know, it's often been said, you know, for many years, obviously, that uh, like supports like and the heart supports the heart and the liver supports the liver. Uh, all animals in the wild eat other animals. They go after the organs first. Same thing in the sea. Uh, and I think uh, humans are better off if we follow that uh, that particular path. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, I think the organ movement is, is coming back uh, strong. And uh, I'm really happy to see that uh, because I think it would be a shame to waste the best parts of the animals uh, as well. And um, yeah, it's good to see uh, butchers, you know, starting to get some of these organs, uh, you know, back in the, in the front window. So people can start, you know, thinking about how they're going to cook with them because, you know, you really can, um, you know, satisfy a, a good portion of your needs with, you know, a single serve of liver, of kidneys, heart. Um, and you don't need much. I think that's, that's the thing. It's, it's a, it's a great way uh, particularly if you're doing seafood as well. I mean, you cover so many bases. Um, one thing uh, I'm really interested in that I, I know you are as well is using the sun uh, as medicine, using light. Um, you know, here in Australia, it's it's very much a taboo subject. You can't really talk about going out in the sun without sunscreen. So um, I was wondering what you think the primary benefits of getting sun exposure are. Yeah, and again, that's where the work of Gerald Pollack, you know, really comes in is that, you know, when you expose light uh, to, you know, to the to the tube, that's what makes the the fluid flow through it. Uh, and I think, you know, same thing with the blood vessels as well. Again, the benefits of the sun increasing nitric oxide, obviously vitamin D production, sun exposure during the day leads to melatonin secretion at night. Uh, the skin is a solar panel. And unfortunately, we've been just, uh, you know, propagandized in the, in the wrong direction, you know, regarding that. I mean, again, the, the skin is a light collector. The, the, the eyeballs are, are a light collector. And what does everybody do? They walk around with their sunglasses and their sunscreen and their hats. And, uh, you know, and ultimately, skin cancer rates are as high as they are. Uh, but I think it really plays into the whole thing. It's just, you know, if you go out and get sunburned, you're in trouble. But if you do it the right way, if you're eating the right animal-based uh, uh, and seafood based uh, diets and you get smart sunshine a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the noon, a little bit in the afternoon, gradually increasing, right? I mean, all, all, all life is outside in the sun. All plants, all animals are outside. All humans were outside. It is only the modern human who sits inside and then they cover themselves from head to toe when they go out. Uh, major, major mis you know, mistake. Uh, there is some debate in the literature again about uh, outdoor workers 
uh, uh, having the lowest risk of melanoma. Some studies say yes, some studies say no. Uh, you know, the, the diet of someone who works outdoors typically is not very good either. So again, that is a confounding factor. But I think ultimately, if we look back to Tom Hanks in the movie, and we think about you know, eating coconuts, fish and avocados and vegetables, He's physically active, he goes to sleep on time, he wakes up on time, he's in and out of the sun on time. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, it, it's really the whole thing. You know, vitamin A is a known uh, extreme sun, uh, you know, uh, you know, protector, you know, of the skin and of the eyes. Omega-3 is the same. So we got to do it all, in, you know, again, in concordance with nature. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great tip. It's not, you know, I think a lot of these researchers are actually asking the wrong questions and it, it leads to things that you might think are answers, but you know, they're totally devoid of context. So I'm hoping people can just be intuitive and think, well, we evolved in the sun uh, you know, every day, all the time. So it's probably not bad for us, at least um, not, at least in the right context, it can't be bad for us. Um, I wanted to ask you about hypertension um, as it pertains to electrolytes. Um, what do you think is the cause of um, hypertension and what, what's the role of um, the primary electrolytes uh, in governing blood pressure? Well, you know, ultimately blood pressure is, uh, it's, it's not a disease, it's a sign uh, that something is dysfunctional. So when blood pressure goes up, there's a reason for that. And we have to find the reason as I started off the conversation, you know, uh, you know, with my wife telling me to become a doctor of cause. So if we look at it through that lens of becoming a doctor of cause, what are the causes of high blood pressure? Well, it's a violation of all things inside, you know, eat well, live well, think well. So we know again, the wrong foods lead to high blood pressure, the wrong lifestyle, lack of sunshine, lack of sleep, lack of physical activity, exposure to environmental toxins and pollutants. Uh, poor dental health, uh, uh, vertebral subluxations and lack of chiropractic care. And then again, stress, anger, anxiety, depression, social isolation all lead to elevated blood pressure. Uh, back to uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, and again, where the, the sulfur deficiency would lead to high blood pressure as well. And then I guess to answer to your question, certainly deficiencies of magnesium are very well known to lead to high blood pressure, but don't forget about potassium. As we test people's levels, tests don't guess. You know, uh, someone like Sinatra, for example, would put people on, on magnesium straight away, but maybe it's not a magnesium issue. Maybe it was a potassium issue. And, uh, and ultimately, potassium is extremely important. So, you know, all those things tend to lead to high blood pressure, all those different factors. And the pharmaceuticals are just another Band-Aid approach. Pharmaceuticals can lower blood pressure, but ultimately, they don't change outcomes. You don't get an award because your blood pressure is better. You want to know, if I take this pharmaceutical, am I going to live longer? Am I going to have less chance of heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, kidney disease? And what we know from the pharmaceutical trials with those drugs is that if they work, which is a big if, according to their data, then uh, the, the benefit is extremely small. So it's not about reducing your stroke risk from five to 4.8%. It's about how do you reduce your stroke risk to 0%, which they don't do, which I believe that we do just by following uh, the uh, natural tenets of, of mother nature. Absolutely. And I, I think it's the same story with statins as well. They, they lower cholesterol, but they don't extend life. So it's kind of, what's the point if, if, if the metric that you're looking for doesn't actually match up with, um, you know, life extension outcomes. So, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the on statin, statin propaganda is very, very bad. Obviously I've not written a prescription for statin drugs in many years. And, um, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, the trial from 2017 in uh, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, certainly one of the top five medical journals in the entire world, if not one of the, if not the biggest, uh, they came out with a trial uh, called um, uh, All Hat, uh, A-L-L-H-A-T, L-L-C. And what they looked at was statin drug use, uh, pravastatin versus placebo. And they looked at it in an older population, 65 and older. And what they found is that in the, uh, in the population 65 and older, mortality actually increased by 18%. If you were 75 and older, mortality actually increased by 34%. So uh, lipid numbers drop, and, but mortality goes up, which when you make the public aware of that, uh, they, uh, they think otherwise. And ultimately, a cardiologist would look at that data and say, well, yeah, other trials show otherwise. Well, two months ago, another trial was uh, published. It was actually a meta-analysis of 21 different trials. And uh, ultimately, for primary and secondary prevention, 
So again, thousands and thousands of people included in this. Uh, stroke risk is reduced by 0.1% annually, heart attack risk by 0.3% annually, and mortality uh, rate is lowered by 0.2% uh, annually, which is embarrassing. It, it, it's, it's frankly embarrassing. That's what has led me to comment that statin drugs actually are responsible for killing millions of people. Uh, number two, because of the obvious side effects related to statin drugs, which are extensive and, and well uh, published, but certainly could be better uh, uh, promoted and, and a better, you know, clarification and honest interpretation of the data. Uh, but ultimately, number one is that it's a false sense of security. You know, people think that they can take a Lipitor and eat and live however they want, and ultimately they die because of that uh, uh, false belief. Yeah, it's a real problem. It's a really, really big problem. And I think there's not enough people uh, calling calling it out for, for what it is. You know, it's clearly not not extending life um, the way that, you know, it's being touted to, but hopefully conversations like this can get people, um, you know, a little more aware of the drug side effects and the actual, um, you know, the effects that it's having, not being, not being nearly what people think they are. So, um, I wanted to ask you about earthing or, or grounding. Um, this is very, it's a very new sort of, uh, thing in the literature. I think there's only about 20 something papers on it. Um, but it does seem very interesting and it seems logical uh, as far as I can tell. What are your thoughts on, on using grounding um, as a way to, um, you know, increase blood flow, um, decrease total body voltage, all of those types of things? Well, I think that, you know, listen, everybody feels better when they're at the beach, right? It's kind of like a summation of all things positive, right? You know, we, we mentally feel better when we're there, uh, uh, probably because, yeah, we're, we're not working, we're kind of on vacation, we're on the beach, you know, a little bit. Uh, and then again, the, the, the natural benefits of being there, you know, barefoot in the sand, uh, the water, uh, the sunshine, typically all those things play together into the benefits of earthing. And again, I think that uh, in most places, when you're walking around barefoot, you're better connected. But I think, also, you know, we do have to be careful that there is so dirty electricity in the ground. And when you actually measure the voltage of the ground, uh, you can see uh, uh, really these high levels of, you know, man-made um, uh, electromagnetic fields that are coming from the earth, which uh, therefore, you know, you really need to question that what is the best environment to be earthing in. And I think that's definitely a concern, need more research on that. But again, that's just a common sense thing where you look at uh, millions of years of human evolution, humans are walking around barefoot. Uh, and uh, I think ultimately it's a better, better strategy from a biomechanics uh, you know, basis, a functional basis. Uh, and then as a, you know, yeah, leads to, you know, cardiovascular brain health and wellness uh, that all plays into it. But unfortunately we live in a pretty dirty earth and it's only going to get dirtier. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. So do you think it, there's a possibility that it could be very helpful, but, you know, it requires a lot of context to apply? Well, I mean, I think like anything, you know, would require context, uh, you know, in the best context to make it applicable. But I think also, listen, you know, see how you feel. You know, if you feel better, you know, doing that kind of strategy, then likely it's a good strategy. If for some reason, I've never heard of anybody who really felt worse, you know, because they were walking barefoot out in the soil, uh, you know, or, or you know, or, or wherever they may be, um, you know, typically people would uh, would feel better. But um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I definitely think it is useful. Uh, I, I can't really say that I've seen a lot of people who say, you know, my wife is or my life is miraculously better because of. It. And then again, a lot of those kind of earth mat technologies, I would put those into question as well, where you're kind of, you know, you're plugging into the wall, but it's the, but it's the ground port. I don't know when I've done that and I've, I've experimented with that, you know, which is really years ago, probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago where I've done those earthing mats. I never liked the way I felt. So I never, I never recommended using them. Interesting. Yeah. I've had, um, I've had a friend of mine uh, also say, yeah, it was, I felt really bad on it. And then he moved the cable and he's like, oh, it must've been where the cable was. So um, yeah. Interesting. I, I'm not sure what to make of it uh, just yet. Uh, I'd like to see a few more studies come out on that. Um, what are some labs that you think people could run you know, if they could run a few labs to assess their um, cardiovascular health, what, what are some really important ones that you would, you would suggest? 
Yeah, well, you know, I do want to make sure we dive into this because, uh, you know, there's a lot of holistic cardiologists out there who recommend coronary calcium scans, coronary CT scans to assess the coronary artery um, uh, disease or calcification, if you will. I never have ordered that test. I never will order that test. I am diametrically opposed to ordering that test. Uh, obviously, it's radiation-based, heavy radiation, and uh, I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it changes what my plan is. So instead of doing that, I do the most advanced laboratory testing in the world where you're looking at all the markers of inflammation, oxidative stress, and advanced lipid, lipids and metabolics, intracellular vitamins and minerals, and glutathione and CoQ10 and omega-3s. But uh, something I think also is a 21st century crisis, which deserves a lot more attention uh, than, than uh and not to minimize these other things, but deserves more attention than EMF, uh, toxic metals, uh, you know, whether or not we should ground or, you know, supplements. And that's a subject of mold and mold mycotoxins. Mold mycotoxins are released from the mold. Uh, these indoor molds that are growing in water damaged buildings. So uh, including your home. So as, as uh, water damages from under a, a sink or a toilet or a shower and laundry machine, your, your um, uh, you know, dishwasher, uh, this, this water damage that occurs leads to mold growth. Mold wants to survive, so it releases its Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Those are mycotoxins. We do urinary mold mycotoxins on people, and just about every, everybody has significant levels. And if they don't, I would say they've got a problem where they're not excreting those mold mycotoxins in the urine, and that may be a dish, different issue as well. So sometimes you have to do some form of of natural chelation, like a glutathione IV to flush out some of those mold mycotoxins to show people what they have. And uh, ultimately I did a I did a 45 minute presentation to 2000 healthcare practitioners a few months ago. And that was, that was entitled uh, mold mycotoxins and, and cardiovascular disease. And again, just slide after slide after slide of how these mold mycotoxins kill humans. And it's not personal against humans. They just want to survive. So the, the, uh, the weapons that the that the mold has developed uh, to get rid of insects and other bacteria and, and other molds, you know, for that matter, they're trying to protect themselves. And in the protection of themselves, they injure humans. And uh, again, what's lurking under the walls, under the shower, under the sink, under the toilet uh, could literally kill you. So again, test, don't guess, figure out the levels there. Other environmental toxins that we also test for, right? So pesticides, phthalates, parabens, uh, VOCs, uh, BPA, you know, and, and plastic levels, all those things help to give you insight as to, as to what's going on, giving you the cause, the why of why people are sick. And uh, the more we continue to uncover with all these, uh, all these tests, we can really show people the difference. But, you know, ultimately I rely on that information as opposed to a coronary CT scan where your score is, oh, you're a 200, you're a 300, you're a 400. Okay, now what? Well, uh, I don't know, I guess you could go on a statin or you could take an aspirin, you know, that's, that's the kind of information people get out of that. I hate, I, I really, really hate that test. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate because a lot of holistic providers promote it. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just the wrong move. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that approach. You know, um, what, what's the point in having a number if you've got no plan? Um, I think the mold story is one that's, you know, really going to play quite an important role in um, medicine in, in the coming years, because I think there's so many people who are struggling with mold illness who have no idea they're even struggling with mold illness. Um, from my understanding, it's very, very difficult to remediate a mold damaged house. Uh, it's very expensive. It's time consuming. You have to like leave the house. Uh, so for those who might be in, you know, a, a new house or uh, they 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 know they don't have mold damage yet. What steps can you take to prevent mold from from growing in the first place? Well, you know, again, if you have an older home, you can pretty much rest assured that uh, well, not rest assured. You can pretty much uh, be certain that you do have mold. But just because your house is brand new, it takes you know 24, 40, 48 hours for mold to start growing. So again, you know, a new house leakage or whatever it may be. Um, and, and how do you prevent that? It's really just uh, just being super diligent about your home and, and 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 where the water is and making sure that it's not there hiring inspectors and again testing yourself those are all possibilities now the remediation aspect is very difficult it can be difficult it's very expensive 
Um, it leads to a lot of divorces. It leads to a lot of financial bankruptcies to a woman, for example, who is overtly sick where she has extreme brain fog and migraines or has fertility issues. That woman would be very easy to get her to understand that the mold is leading to her symptoms and she will be very quick, most likely to enact the changes that need you know, to be made. But what about the 63 year old guy with atrial fibrillation or the 59 year old woman who recently suffered a heart attack uh, getting them to understand that mold is part of the problem can be a little bit more difficult. And then, as you said, yeah, when you talk about, uh, you know, the, the cost of remediation, can you even remediate some homes? And now people are spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, or you tell people you have to throw out all your clothes or all your, you know, and all your furniture and all your uh, family, you know, family mementos, or you tell someone, here's what I want you to do. I want you to shower and then I want you to walk outside naked where you will have a fresh brand new pair of uh, organic uh, cotton scrubs or, or sweatpants and sweatshirt or t-shirt or whatever it may be uh, waiting outside and then say goodbye to your old life and start new. That's a difficult proposition for a lot of people, especially if they're suffering from mold, uh, you know, you know, from, uh, you know, from brain fog and some of these other things, or again, uh, you know, uh, four out of five times it's the woman. And then how does the woman convince the man, her husband, hey, we got to pay for all this money, do all this stuff. Um, it's uh, and, and ultimately all these things lead to why this is such a major crisis. But just because it leads to all those different issues doesn't mean that we shouldn't diagnose it, shouldn't tell people. And, uh, you know, again, there's air purification strategies. There are binders and detoxification strategies that can assist the process, but you have to get out. Uh, you know, you got to get, you know, you got to remove the source. Yeah, I, I'm super glad you touched on that because I, I wasn't necessarily planning on going there. But um, mold is something that I'm very quickly starting to realize is something I need to learn a lot about very quickly. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'm probably not going to well, take. Well, you know, I mean, well, let me say, you know, Cameron too. It's like, well, you know, hasn't mold been around since the dawn of humans? And the answer is yes. But again, the building materials, the you know, the locked-in homes, the lack of breathability of modern homes clearly leads to a problem. And then you take the mycotoxins and then you add everything else on top of it, right? Violations of eat well, live well, think well. So you take a population that doesn't eat the right foods. They don't get the sleep. They don't get the sunshine. They don't get the physical activity. They're exposed to all the environmental toxins that we previously discussed. Um, they're, they're living in a state of inflammation uh, for all those reasons and poor dentition. So it's, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, it, it's why it really, you know, leads to the 21st century crisis of what it is, but it's pretty darn uh, difficult to heal from the other things when you're still living in this, uh, you know, swamp and breathing in the mold mycotoxins, big problem. And ultimately, yeah, sometimes, you know, it's why a lot of people, you know, I think a lot of people feel better when they're on holiday or, you know, as, as you guys would call it on vacation, as we would call it. So we're on vacation, we feel better. Well, again, the stress is reduced, but the environment changes up. Uh, and that can be different. You know, I feel better when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm at the shore. Well, you know, because you don't live by the shore, so you feel better there for a variety of reasons, including because you may be out of your moldy home. Now, you may go to a place where you leave one mold, uh, one mold box, if you will, one moldy home uh, for another, but those mold mycotoxins may be different, and those molds may not be bothering you, or they may bother you, and, and time will tell. But um, I'm glad you understand the appreciation of that. And again, we've got the ability to test uh, for it in urinary mold mycotoxin testing. And uh, the literature, uh, although again, it's not effusive, you know, when you compare it to, you know, blood pressure drugs, statin drugs, uh, you know, chemotherapy agents, uh, you know, all, all, the, all the literature that's been produced on COVID over the last two years, right, supersedes uh, every bit of health and wellness information that's ever been uh, uh, put into the literature. So yeah, we, we got our work cut out for us. Yeah, hopefully this conversation is filled with enough uh, information to really help people um, become empowered and, and, you know, really start to take back some control with um, what they're doing in their life and, and really put their health back on track. Um, I'm not going to keep any more of your time. Uh, I know how busy you are, but uh, I've had a really awesome conversation. And I've, I've learned quite a bit. So thank you so much for your time. No, thank you, Cameron. I appreciate you helping me get the word out. Yeah, awesome. All right. Keep doing what you're doing, man. I really appreciate it. Take it easy. You got it. You keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.
Thanks so much for listening to this episode. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to keep up with Jack's work, I've put all of his links in the episode notes. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. You can also leave up to a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This is a simple, no-cost way to support my work and help me reach more listeners. Please feel free to leave any comments on my YouTube channel as I do try to read through as many as I can. I've also put links to all of my social media platforms in the episode notes if you'd like to keep up to date with the podcast, get any information about health, or you'd just like to reach out to me in general. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.